YouTube and it should also be Facebook groups at the same time. Let me just check that this is actually going live and I'm just checking these things now. So I can see that my restream or multi-streaming tool I use is connecting to Facebook and also I can see it's connecting to YouTube. So if you don't know or if you're just watching this for the first time, my name is Thomas Parkinson and I'm a six-figure Amazon seller for the last three years and also as well I run the UK-based Amazon Arbitrage Lead Service Fast Track FBA. And today what I really want to go through is quite simply Q1, talking about things Q1 or January for 2020 because it's a big time changing from Q4 into Q1. But then also as well, I've been asked a question to share some of my knowledge about wholesale and my thoughts behind it and what we've done in the past which has worked. So today really two things I'm going to be talking through in a bit of detail. Q1 and how that's going to affect your business and things to watch out for and obviously top tips to do but then number two is wholesale and an introduction into wholesale if you don't know but I'll kind of deep dive into it quite quickly and just share some top tips that I've got. So I can just check now I can see that I'm live on the Facebook group so that's fantastic and I'm just checking now I think I should be coming live onto the YouTube channel so if you're here watching this with me be sure to say hello, say hi, drop your name in the comments or in the messages. Obviously that's going to be great to see and obviously if you've got any questions honestly let me know, drop it down below and what I will do is I will obviously answer those questions as I come through and obviously if there's anything that I can't get done during this live webinar what I will also do is talk about it at another time but just let me know that you're in the Facebook group, group so that's fantastic mute that that's me being a bit loud so brilliant I've got the chat coming up I've got Reem Alam hey so I'll say just say hey great to see you hey great to see you again any questions let me know um, if you want to know normally I'm based out in Vietnam but today is a little bit different I'm actually back in the UK uh, obviously it's Christmas time and I am in sunny Southampton and the sun's going down and it's not so it's sunny but it's a bit cold but I am in Southampton today and then later on after Christmas and into the new year I'll be doing a road trip around the UK just connecting with other sellers and learning a lot about their journey as well but if I just say if I'm just looking at the Facebook I can see now that a couple of people are live on the Facebook screen so if you are there just drop a hi in the Facebook group chat so I've got Sean Paul Gilbert in boom Sean good to see you what I will do is before I quickly start on Q1 and I know that was a question about Sean so I will share that is to say look if you are watching this give me a thumbs up obviously just let me know you're there and hey if maybe you're watching this on the replay what I'll do is I will drop a link into the next live that I'm going to do so if you want to subscribe you can certainly look at signing up for the next one as well so I'll just drop them now into the the Facebook group and also as well into the YouTube chat so two seconds okay so right let me get started on Q1 now Sean basically asked a question around uh, what is Q1 or how is the effect on Q1 gonna have on his Amazon arbitrage business now my understanding of Sean's business is that he does RA and OA and this is his first year if I'm correct in thinking and he's going to be changing from you know the madness which is Q4 and oh my god I love Q4 I still love it now sales are coming in not as great but Q4 is a great time Time. it's you know, sales are going through the roof people are buying from the Amazon platform but now it's changing now we're coming into Christmas because today is the 22nd and what we're really looking at is to say what is that change going to look like between now and coming into Q1 so if I kind of just scroll down if I say Sean's asked a question what to expect or, you know what happens after the 23rd and what routine do you change ready for Q1 and how much will my sales dramatically drop and what have you learned to build up into Q1 sales you know, he asked the question do you clear off old stock in January and now what I want to talk through that is just some of the top tips that I've taken away or that I've got for Q1 so I'm going to release a video on this in the next couple of days but I will kind of go through that for you is to say look there are nine things that I would probably say Q1 you want to be aware of so look number one is don't stop buying the one thing is is people say sales stop Amazon stops well yes they slow down because the majority of people are buying on Amazon if you think about it during December during Q4 people are coming to Amazon to buy presents for all their loved ones 
Now, unless they're buying for themselves in Q1, they might only be buying for a birthday, they might be buying for something else, but the volume of purchasing isn't going to be as much as it is during the Christmas time. So sales do slow down, but they don't stop. And the only thing that's going to stop you from making sales is if you stop buying and stop selling. So top tip for you is keep buying. There are going to be products that are going to continue selling that will sell all year round. Keep buying those products. Now, the second bit, which I'd probably say for Q1, and this kind of sounds a bit counterintuitive, is to before you finish Q4, have a think. Have a think about Q4 just gone. And the reason is, is obviously you're in this business, you're hopefully in this business for the long term. You want to be selling on Amazon long term. And now you've just been through the busiest, the most profitable time of your Amazon year. This is where we make all our money Q4. And the last thing you want to do is get over Q4, get into Q1 and be like, oh my God, it's awful. Chase, 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 chase. And then Q2, Q3, and then you're back to Q4 again. What you really want to do now is just take a day, take a two days, go back over your business, have a think about your sourcing, have a think about your logistics, think about your team, think about your sales, think about everything in your business, what has really worked and what hasn't. Because what you really want to do is have a plan in place for next year. So for 2020 Q4, you want to be thinking about, you know what, what products sold really well? Where did I buy too much or where did I buy not enough? What products haven't sold well? Uh, where in my logistics or in my sourcing has not done well that I could improve upon? You know, if you like Sean, and I've seen a lot of his Facebook lives where he's done, he's out in the van sourcing. And I, there's going to be a big question, which stores delivered more products than the other stores? So next year, Q4, he's going to want to hit those stores massively, and maybe the stores that didn't so much, maybe try some other stores instead. And that's for his RA retail arbitrage business, but for OA, it's going to be exactly the same. Think about what's working and what's not. And so next year, you are going to have a plan, an action, a learning from Q4 20, 2019 that you can literally just implement and have a look at, here's where my sales ramp up. If my sales ramped up then, I need to have stocking by this time. And for you is just saying, come on, let's get this done. Let's action it, action it, action it. And that's going to be super, super key to growing and driving your 2020. So top tip number two, reflect on Q4 2019 so that Q4 2020 is the best Q4 you've ever had. That's that. So I've made a little note down here, so I want to make sure I'm getting them right for you. So look, top tip number three for me is... What I'd say is anyone is stay on top of returns. Now, your returns are going to go up. That's a fact. But you know why? Because you sold more products. Generally speaking, for me, in all the Q4s I've done, I've done three now, I get more returns. But percentage wise, they're about the same. The only thing which I would say is if you've sold something way over price or maybe a really poor product, then that might come back in higher, higher demand or more frequency. But if you are just selling products as normal, but you sold more of them, yes, you're going to get more returns, but they are the same. So for you is think about your returns, how you do it. Um, also as well, you know, get them inspected. Can you sell them back on Amazon? You might be able to sell them back as new, you know, used, not new. Uh, think about eBay. Think about even reselling on Facebook Marketplace. Um, if you're like me, I live out in Vietnam most of the time. So I use a service from a company called Easy Logic, and I'll drop a link down afterwards whereby they take I ship my returns to them and they'll basically sell them on eBay for me and take a cut of the revenue. Uh, not the most not the best way, but if you literally can't deal with them then that's better than literally binning them or destroying them because that's that's gonna work. So top tip number three, stay on top of your returns. Now for you, and this is kind of coming back to the question Sean asked about what do I need to do? Q one is number four, I would say think about changing your categories. In Q4, you are buying toys and games left, right and centre. Now, these are great products. They sell massively during Q4, but they're not such big sellers because obviously not everyone's got a birthday. Not everyone's buying Christmas presents every month for that one special day in January. And again, the one special day in February. Christmas Day doesn't happen every month. It only happens in December. So things like toys and games, they ramp up during Christmas and then after that, you're down. 
So for you, think about changing categories. Think about doing, you know, things like groceries. Think about beauty. Think about home and garden. You know, January is going to be really big for like health, gym equipment, sports and nutrition, sports equipment. That is going to be, um, you know, that is going to be something that people are going to buy now. But also, these kind of products will sell all year round. So they're going to be really useful for you just having consistent sellers. And a lot about your Amazon business is yes, we want to take advantage of you know, times when we can arbitrage and make great deals. And, you know, if you didn't see when I did my Amazon advent calendar flips, I made £886 off flipping advent calendars in two weeks. And if you're watching on the replay, I'll drop a little link up there. But, you know, that's, that's fantastic and we can do that in Q4. But what we do want is like a bedrock of consistent sellers that might be grocery, beauty, home and garden, you know, kitchen equipment. The things just sell all year long that everyone has to buy. You know, think shampoos, think hair gels, those kind of things. They're going to be useful for consistent sellers throughout the year. And January is a great time to start moving out of those toys and games and into more consistent sellers. So number four, change your categories. Think about new ones. So for me, number five, and the one thing I looked at kind of number five is, you know, it's kind of moving on from changing the categories is think about replenishable items. So yes, January has things like gym equipment that they work for, but it might be a, 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 should say a bigger hit during January. What you really want to use is this time to start finding those products whereby you can just replenish throughout the year. They're going to be your consistent sellers. So number four is change the categories. And then number five is work on replenishables. So these are just simple things that roll over, roll over. If I give you a top tip, predominantly they are found in groceries and they're predominantly bundles. So top tip there, that's where a lot of these things because people just buy and buy and buy. So number six is in December, I was, or well, number six is go wide, not deep. Now, the simple thing is in Q4, for me and my business, I was buying, you know, a thousand pounds worth of certain items. You know, I think one item cost 300 pounds just for one item. So I was happy to go drop one or 2000 pounds on a certain item, but in Q1, what I want to do is now actually start having a lot less of them. The reason is in Q4, we've got massive sales volumes. There's great opportunity to buy quick and sell quick and flip it like I did with the advent calendars. But now the idea is to have a lot more products go a lot wider so that you're not exposed to any one too much. But then actually you're because each one's selling a lot less, but now you've got a lot more products. The volume is actually selling roughly the same and you're keeping the same. Now that kind of talks a little bit about what Sean asked in regards to how bad will his stock be or how bad will his, what should we say, how bad will his sales drop off that cliff? Now I don't know the answer because interesting enough if you're selling baby nappies and you're selling hair gel, probably going to be the same. Like it's not really going to change because you're consistent about, you're consistent throughout the year, these are consistent sellers. But if you are selling nothing but advent calendars, then I'll guarantee you your sales are going to go right down. So for you, it's now a chance to think about what kind of stock you're selling. If you're very heavily into toys and games, then I'd say actually you want to start, start diversifying out of them. Look at some different products. Look at things like groceries, beauties, like we said again. Look at your um, different products that you can replenish. And then again, go wide, get lots of different products in, but not very many of each one, and just see what sells, and then keep rebuying the ones that are doing well. So top tip number six is go wide not deep. So number seven is, I think, look, do, I mean, look, number seven, the one thing I said here is do expect some sales to keep selling the same as Q4. So in regards to that, what I mean is that in Q4, we had lots of opportunities to buy and sell on the Amazon platform, or should we say buying from the suppliers. There will be a lot of sales going on still. January, especially in Q1, is a great time to pick up some great bargains. You know, it's Christmas has come, now stores have got clearance. They've maybe got end of line items, or maybe the items they just don't want to stock anymore that are not finishing. But you can get in there and buy those products. You can get them cheap. And the top tip I'd probably share with you is I've heard a lot of stories of people buying things in January, which are going to be great deals for summer. So, you know, simple things like people buying um, what are they buying like summer wear or they're buying camping equipment now these kind of things might not be or sports equipment now if it's indoor fine but if it's outdoor equipment it might be like now it's too cold who's going to want that 
well exactly right now you're not going to be sourcing that you're not going to be looking to sell that immediately but the ROI on it comparing to now versus summer is going to be amazing and for you is looking at that data what is the price now what is the selling price I'm giving for now might not be great but have a quick look you know put your keeper into summer last year see what it's selling for if you can pick up some really good bargains during those January sales that if you're happy to hold on for a couple of months then coming into summer you can actually sell them for a really really good markup and a lot of people now you know what we're seeing with arbitrage is the fact that you know, a lot of people want to buy it and sell it within a month or two but actually that's not the truth they're actually buying it and selling it three four five six months later and actually when you start thinking about that is interesting enough the deals you're buying now are going to be selling in summer so why not think about buying great ROI deals now that aren't going to make money now but in summer when you ship them in they're going to fly out they're going to get you a great ROI because you bought them at such a good good margin or buying at such a good price in January that is going to be really useful for you so top tip number seven is keep buying but look at the sales and think about going forward so that's number seven now number eight is kind of using the same analogy I've just given you so when you're looking at buying something in Q4 if we say if you think about buying something in Q4 or when you're buying in Q4 sorry when you're looking to buy something in Q1 forget Q4's data because if you look at you know the keeper sales or the sales rank information this is all based on December now in January January isn't December and you could not have two different months December sell 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 January not so for you top tip I'd say for you is when you are looking at that information i.e. should I buy this product now or not forget and I'm saying this forget looking at December or forget looking at last month load up your keeper scroll back to the same time last year January and have a look at that that is going to give you some key information and if I kind of quickly scroll through here's one that I found earlier if I just go small and I'll just double check yeah I've got small so this is obviously you can tell this product is an advent calendar now if you were here's the graph not a problem if I was looking at just the last three months you know we know this isn't gonna sell at all in January or if it does it's gonna be very minimal but interestingly enough if I zoom in if I look at this keeper chart I'm gonna go wow these sales are great you know it's going down to 6,000 sales rank it's coming up a bit more 60,000 now but you might look at that and go over the last six months it's got a good sales history but you know because it's an advent calendar it's gonna be lying but actually what you want to be looking at is saying let's have a look at the year graph and see what's happened back January last year and obviously looking at January last year you're gonna say okay this product doesn't sell in January and it doesn't have a life in February and it definitely doesn't sell in March so for you now is thinking about forget December forget the queue the data for the last month don't look at that go back to keeper look at last year's that's gonna give you the real information that you're gonna to need to make a informed buying decision um, and hey if you're if you're someone like Sean perhaps who's maybe doing RA uh, an app like SAS and I'll drop a link down below when I get a chance you know they have a mobile app and that shows you all the keeper information and you can go into the keeper chart and actually scroll back a year and have a look at that so that's really important or if you've got keeper you could also as well I think you can scan keeper app or ask it on messenger and then it will tell you or show you the graph which is gonna be really useful so for you is using last year's information not not just the last month's information so January February March and that's my top tip number eight and then finally top tip number nine if I make myself big again top tip number nine for you is to say look this is a time that maybe you've got a chance to look at your business you're reflected see where your sales have come from but now focus on getting ungated in other categories so and the reason why I say this is during Q4 a lot of things are gated and they will not accept applications toys and games is a good example although I have seen some people ungated on toys and games during Q4 but for you is to say what I'd recommend is what we're looking to do is actually get you ungated in new categories because hey when you're out and when you're out and you're should we say looking at different products you want to, if you find a great deal you now want to be able to get in there and buy it because hey it might not be toys and games or it might be something so for you think about getting yourself ungated in different categories and this is just going to set you up for the year ahead because now q1 q2 q3 are going to be really good
And what I will do is I'll drop a link as well down below to a free guide that I created on how to basically get yourself ungated for next to free. It's not exactly, but if you're not sure, you can just do that as well. So I'll drop that into both of the groups. So top tip number nine for you is get yourself ungated. Now for me, they're my kind of nine top tips about going through the change from quarter four 2019 to quarter one 2020. And it's really about changing the shift in what you're doing and setting yourself up now with replenishables, different categories. So you're having consistent sellers throughout Q1, Q2, Q3. And interesting enough, if you want to know, building yourself up for a baseline in Q4 next year that maybe you're getting, I don't know, 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 pounds worth of sales in you know, January, February, March, April, May, all the way through to Q4 next year. But you'll have that 20,000 pounds worth of sales consistently throughout the year. And then now when Q4 comes, you can start buying your Legos, your advent calendars, things that are just gonna really push up the sales in Q4. And bang, that takes you from 20,000 up to maybe 50,000. You know, even some people we've seen, they're hitting 80s, you know, maybe closing 100,000 in a 30 day period doing arbitrage as well so that is very viable but for you first things first is build up that that baseline now in q1 q2 and q3 and then that'll set you up for q4 next year but hey that's my kind of top tips but i'm going to have a quick look now and just kind of go through if there are any questions or in the chat and what we've got so if i just start off now with uh, youtube We've got Reem said, for wholesale, are there any good wholesale sellers who work with non-VAT registered sellers? Not asking for names, but if they exist, then I'll look into finding them. Uh, Reem, what I'll do is I'll probably answer that in the wholesale one. Um, but I think my, my top tip for that is it's going to be a numbers game. Um, the biggest problem you're going to face is that I think a lot of wholesale sellers would work with non-VAT registered sellers but your issue comes is that they're that registered. So you're paying that cost on top of it. So it might be the case that you look at doing something like arbitrage until you get to the VAT threshold and then start adding on wholesale after that. Being non-VAT registered seller before that becomes a bit of a problem. Uh, or it doesn't such a problem, it's just cost. So I'll touch more on that when we go into the wholesale section, but what I'll do now is flick over to Facebook and see any questions there. So. Sean's written, holy crap, oh sorry, language, uh, will I get a lot in returns? I've sold a lot higher because sellers ran out. I guess I'll learn from this. If people return them in January with chocolates, they won't, you know, with chocolates, they won't return, but toys, they will. Interesting enough, I think they'll return a lot of things. Um, but Sean, I think you may get a lot of returns, but I think you'd get higher than what your your average is. So say for example, if your current run rate is at 3% returns, you might hit 5% because you sold a bit above. But if you're selling at decent prices throughout Q4, but obviously more volume, you'll stick at 3%. But if you've been selling like a lot of products where they're way overpriced, um, then you might say actually that average might go from 3% up to 5%. So yes, it's gonna be more, but it's not gonna be huge. I wouldn't expect you to be huge. The majority of people actually just can't be bothered to return. They're like, okay, it's only the few who do actually return it. So I wouldn't worry too much, but hey, on the flip side, you've made a downside, you know, a lot of money out of it. And I'd say, you know, that's great. So don't worry. So Sean's just said, does SAS come with full keeper details or just certain keeper date? Well, my understanding of SAS, and if you don't know, this is sourcing analysis simplified. This is a, a Chrome extension for sourcing, but also as well, it is a uh, is a mobile app. And a lot of people are using it for mobiles and I've had some really, really positive reviews. I've not used it myself, but a lot of people have been using it. And I know Al Carton, the creator of it personally, is a really good guy, genuine Amazon seller and a techie, and he knows what he's doing. So this app was actually built for his business and he's basically now shared it with everyone else, which is great. So have a look at SAS. And my understanding of that app is that it will show you the predefined keeper graphs. But what you can do is you can change it from being like 90 days to 30 days to one year, for example. And for you, you just click on the one year button and load up that pre, you know, that, that kind of mini keeper graph, which is one year. And that will be useful for you when you're out scanning. You can check and say, oh, I can see this time last year. It was still selling or this time last year oh my god no the sales range has just gone up that's not going to be a good seller like the advent calendars we looked at 
So, and then Sean's also mentioned here as well. Question, how come gated with frozen Lego toys and some sellers ain't? Uh, a receipt isn't enough to get ungated. If I keep growing my Amazon business, I will get ungated next year, Q4. Or will I still need an invoice, invoice to get ungated this next year? So here's the thing. I don't know about frozen. As far as I'm aware, it could be brand gated frozen. Um, Lego isn't a brand which I think is gated, um, but you will find, you will find, I think it's toys and games you're saying are gated. And the one way I just check that is if I go, if I kind of, uh, one second, mm. Sean, I'll try and explain to you how I know the difference between the two of them. So one second, what I want to do is log into my demo account and then kind of show you how I would check this. So I'm just trying to log in now, but the majority of the time you're going to be gated in what's known as a category, not the brand. And a lot of people I know have been picked up on toys and games. And during Q4, you might be gated in that uh, that category, not the brand. So that's just something to be aware of. So one second, let me close this. Okay, so if I make myself small, so if you want to know, if I just check. Well, uh, yep. So if you want to know, this is a, a separate selling account I've got. We don't actually sell anything on it, so hence why I'm happy to show you. So if I click add products, and hence we've never sold anything on it. If I go add products and put in there, uh, let's do Lego. And if I kind of just come up to this first product, listings, limitations, apply. If you look, what I'll show you is it says here, you need approval to list in the toys and games category. Now, whenever you do any ungating, you're going to see something. It will say the category your brand you're gated in, or the brand you're gated in, or you could be gated in both. Like if I put in, I don't know if I can find one right now, but if it's like Apple was in the toys and games category, then I wouldn't be able to sell Apple as a brand, and I can't sell toys and games. So that would be brand restricted. So I know for a fact that toys and games, for the majority of sellers who are new, are gated during Q4 and can't get ungated. That's if they're not ungated already. But to answer Sean's question, if you have sold and been ungated in toys and games before, then Q4 2020, you should be fine. There will be no problems. So let me just check that I've gone back big. Brilliant. Okay, so that's answering Sean's question to say, look, get your invoice, have a look at that ungated link that I dropped in below and get yourself ungated in Q4 or now in Q1, Q2, Q3, because that's going to really set you up, you know, through this year, obviously selling, but come Q4, you're just going to be selling and you can buy all those great deals, which I'm lucky enough to have this year as well. Um, so yeah, get yourself ungated Q1, really, really important. And then obviously this year you can do so much more. So Sean's also said, um, I'm thinking of coming the 4th of Jan. Luke was on the phone with me for two hours last night. I believe you're going to. So yeah, if you don't know, there's a SaaS workshop going on in the it's kind of like Enfield area. I don't know the exact thing. Um, Enfield area, North London in the UK. And basically, I'm going to be doing a, a speech or a talk, I would say a speech, a presentation on what we've learned in Fast Track FBA. And that's our sourcing service, which I run. So it's how we source, what we do as a team, you know, what we do with all our teams, what we've learned from you know the information and sourcing that we've done, but also as well how that could relate to you and running your teams and your VA team. So top tips on that as well. So lots of information to take on board, and it's not only me speaking. You can have Al Carton speaking there, who is a six-figure seller, but also as well creator of SaaS. Uh, I know Amanda's going to be there, and I think she's probably a seven-figure seller now. And also as well, we've got Luke there as well, who I, I saw a post from him in his group last week where he had done, or maybe this week, where he had done something like £83,000 worth of revenue in the last 30 days just doing arbitrage, which is, you know, which is a fantastic amount and, you know, so much to learn. And hey, I'm really looking forward to just listening to what they've got to say as well. I'm sure I'll be picking up a lot of information and hopefully sharing that back with you. So if you are interested, 4th of January, that is going to be. And what I'll do is I'll drop a link down as well later on, just so if anyone wants to attend that, you can. Um, there is a charge, but we're only charging for like the hotel or charging for the room and everything to go with that. So that's a little bit about that. And I'm just going to have a quick look now back onto YouTube, see any other questions. Uh, Reams mentioned a new Frozen movie has come out this November. So Amazon gated everyone, but anything already in FBA Center is okay to okay to sell temporary gating for q4 i believe well that sounds actually that could be very viable and interesting enough i have seen a lot of people talking about um you know frozen being a real 
touch point for Amazon, i.e. anyone with anything frozen, they're just like on it saying, you know, what what's going on? Can you prove this is can you prove this is legitimate? And hence asking for invoices. So yeah, I really understand that. And Reem, thank you very much for sharing that. That's really good. Right. Let me just grab a quick drink. And then what I'll do next is go on to some wholesale. Now, obviously, if you've got any questions today, what I'm going to say is we're talking through two things. Q1, obviously, we've just gone through. So if you're watching on the replay, scroll back, have a look. And then the second thing we're going to be talking about is wholesale. Now, if you want to know myself, I predominantly do OA, so online arbitrage. And this is where I buy from retail stores and I sell on Amazon. Now, I do do a small amount of wholesale and I've done a lot more in the past, but I've found that for my business and the way I want to structure it, actually, I prefer doing OA for a lot of it, but I still have certain wholesale suppliers that I work with. But I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I'm an expert in, uh, in wholesale at all. I'm not. It represents probably less than 10% of my revenue. But I do have you know, some thoughts on the way I've run it in the past and maybe some things I can share with you, some top tips that are going to really help you in your, your business. And if you're looking to get into wholesale, that's going to be really helpful. So what I'll try and do in the next half an hour is just talk you through a quick overview of it and deep dive into certain sections where it might be quite beneficial for you. So look, my my experience in wholesale actually started at the very beginning of Amazon. Before I even got into OA, I was doing wholesale. And the reason why I got into Amazon selling was actually I had access to multiple distributors and wholesalers as part of my old business that I created, my first business, that I kind of thought to myself, hey, we've opened up these wholesalers, can I not sell them on Amazon? And we started getting Excel sheets of like 500,000 products. It was like, oh my God, it's too much. And if you want to know, they're all in IT. And if you're ever interested, don't look at IT equipment wholesale into Amazon. It's just not worth it. The margins in IT are razor thin and you make all your money in IT by basically doing what's known as rebates with the PC suppliers. So you buy like £10,000 worth of product and then the Dell will give you a refund on a certain amount in credit that you use against the next purchase. So you build up credit. That's the way it works. But I won't go into that too much. So look, for me in wholesale, if you're not really too sure, the wholesale process, i.e., find a supplier, source the products, review their products, and then ship it to your prep center or to your house, get it you know, packaged up and then ship it into Amazon and then sell it, do your accounts and then get it replenished. That process, whether it be online arbitrage or whether it be wholesale, is exactly the same. The only difference is, is that where you're sourcing your products from. So we're now looking at just how we source and what we do. So for me, the, the kind of top tip which I would take away or share with you is have a think about different products. Now, let me just kind of get myself small so you can have a quick look. My kind of top takeaway is and the way we found quite useful was you can Google wholesalers. So you could literally come into Google and you could go, I don't know, let's say, for example, we're looking for, I don't know, Apple. This is really bad. Apple wholesale. I'd never look for Apple wholesale actually really bad you can do you know brand name and wholesale you can do that or you can do wholesale distributors uk and then just kind of go through interesting enough i have an account with west coast they are a seller um and you can do that but the problem comes is that when you google anything these companies they are going to have big websites they're going to be seo'd up they're going to be promoting their products they want people to come and buy from them now generally that's called marketing and marketing ad is a cost so whenever you've got companies which are quite big and they want to advertise and the more they sell their products through like websites and things generally they have more cost to incur and guess where that cost has to go it has to go on the price you pay for products so a lot of the good deals that you're going to find are going to be from probably places that if they have a website they're rubbish or maybe they don't even have a website. Maybe they just literally are not online. Or their website is one page which says, hey, this is who we are. Here's our telephone number. Come in and visit us or send us an email. That's all they do. And that's all they're interested in because they're not interested in selling online. They're not e-commerce people. And on the flip side, the better they are at doing, should we say, websites, etc., etc., the more likely they are to want to sell on Amazon themselves or already have an e-commerce platform that they work through. So just be aware that actually the worse the website, the better. So one thing which you might want to do, and 
you can do Google search, but I generally don't like it. Is come in and say, for example, I'm going to search for something like I might search and come in for hair gel, for example. Now I'm going to look for a product. You know, I'm going to start thinking about a different product. And what I'm trying to show you now is how I might find suppliers, and I might start about looking. So let's just kind of have a scroll down, have a little look, and see look different products. And what I'm going to have a quick think about is if my if I unzoom or I zoom out a bit is to say I've got Amazon, I've got DS Amazon Quick View installed, this little Chrome extension. And right here it shows me sold by Amazon, three FBA sellers, sold by Amazon, three FBA sellers, one FBA seller, seven FBA sellers. Now, interesting enough, first things first, I'm gonna notice that this is sold by FBA sellers, but it's got no Amazon, so I'm interested in that. Now, I might find, you know, I might look at a niche that I wanna get into, let's say, for example, hair products, and I might find a couple of products which aren't sold by Amazon, and have FBA sellers on them already or might not have, but they have more than one seller on them. So let's say for example, this product, I might say here, straight away, this is going for 200 sales per month, maybe 300 sales per month, good sales volume, I'm happy with that. I'd have a quick look at the keeper graph. And I just wanna check, has Amazon sold this product? Yes, they have, but very rarely, but I can see it's quite a lot of movement in price, but it might be that, hey, I'm interested, I'm gonna see if I can get a price for them. So as a product, I'm reasonably interested because Amazon aren't selling this product and they've rarely been on the listing. But number two is the fact that the price is, it's not great, it's 11.48, I generally like to go higher. But if you're looking for something quite small, you might be able to get a couple of pound profit out of it, but it's got good sales, so I like that. Then what I might do is quite simply just go to Google and search the brand. Now, what I'm really looking for is, I'm looking just to find who the manufacturer is. And we say, this guy's here, um, shop, I'm just having a quick look. Oh, interesting enough, they've got wholesale down here, which is quite nice. I'm gonna have a quick look. And I can see here, they're saying they've got an American number. Now, a lot of people might be like, no, not a problem, but I would actually get in contact with them. So I would find a product, perhaps. I would get in contact with the manufacturer. I'd say, I'm really interested in stocking your product. I'm an e-commerce seller. I wouldn't mention Amazon, and I'll touch upon that later, but I wouldn't mention Amazon. And then I would get in contact with them and I'd ask them, you know, can we talk about uh, product quantities that we can order, you know, explain a little bit about us, who we are and our clients. So we sell online, we've got an e-commerce platform. I'd share a link with them as well. And to say, look, here's what I'm trying to do. Can we stock your products? Now, nine times out of 10, they're probably gonna say no. They're probably gonna say, we're not interested in opening up to new suppliers or some other issue. You know, they're getting thousands of these messages every single day. But for me, what I'm asking for straight off the back end of that is, you know, where can I support them from? And what happens is a lot of these people are gonna be asked or telling you, we won't sell to you, but you can look at our distributor. Or maybe with these guys, they are US based. And we say, look, I'm interested in stocking your products. Can you ship to the UK? Or do you have a UK distributor we can work with? And then we can kind of find out. So they will give you the names of the next person in the list who get their products. And if you don't know a bit about wholesale or supply chain and distribution, you have the manufacturer, i.e. the person who makes it, and then you have distribution. And say for example, if it's like Apple, uh, Apple make a product. Now, Apple actually sell their products to companies like West Coast, who is a distributor we saw just a minute ago. Then West Coast will sell it to resellers who will then sell it to the end customer. If you want to know distributors are not authorized to sell to the end customer, they, they are only authorized to sell to the next seller and then they go to the customer. So for you is asking you know, a brand like this, say, hey, can you let me who your distributors are or who can I sell from? They might sell from wholesale, they might sell to distributors, and then you can get involved. So they'll give you a point of contact and they'll tell you who to call. And then what I would do is I would then go speak to them. I would reference that, you know, I've spoken to the manufacturer, I spoke to this person, we had a really good conversation, but it just wasn't right that we could work with them. I'd make it kind of sound we had a good relationship, but then they've recommended you know, this distributor or this brand or this wholesaler, sorry, distributor wholesaler that I'd speak to. So then I'm trying to build that relationship. I'm trying to build that rapport. And hopefully they're gonna say, okay, yeah, we can stock this and I'll, the, we, we sell this. And I'll just ask them, hey, what else do you sell? I'm interested, you know, we are looking for multiple brands to sell. And a lot of the time, these guys are just gonna give you a whole list. They might give you a CSV file, Excel file. They might give you a PDF file, which is a bit of a pain. They might even give you a website, which is really bad, um, or you know, kind of something amalgamated like that. But that is where you now start getting 
with this one product and maybe you might make money off that product or not or it just doesn't work out but now you're starting to get access to lots of other products at probably really good rates because these guys are you know really high up in that food chain they're getting really close to manufacturers and they're going to be getting it cheap so for me is always go to manufacturer but nine times out of ten it's not going to work but get your distributor get your wholesaler the next person in that chain and speak to them the higher up you go the more likely you are to get better discounts now I'll try and build a rapport with them and once I've kind of figured out that you know there's products here I'm going to spend my time I'm going to go through those products you know if it's something like hair products hair gel oh well doesn't make it so okay, big if you're looking at like hair products hair gel you are going to be thinking about you know bundles you're going to be thinking about you know can I make new listings perhaps it's not really something that I do but you might do uh, there can be different bundles new listings and just you know how it works um, also look at seasonal you know how does the seasons work now one thing I'd probably look at is to say when I was doing wholesale what I would do is I generally find that the margins I would make off their initial price lists weren't as good as what you're looking at on OA so I would reduce my ROI and predominantly most of the time I'd be looking at about a 30% ROI or 15% margin but now in wholesale I'd probably say benchmark baseline about 20% ROI but in addition to that I'd be looking at sales volume so I'd add a note okay this hits about 20% ROI but the sales volume is really good now out of that list that they've given me I would pardon me I would make a note of all the products that meet 20% ROI after my shipping, my net, my VAT, and my prep, and then also sell really well. And then what I'd do is I'd go back to the wholesaler, and I would say on my first order, I want to buy all these products, but I would also make sure I'm putting big orders in for the high volume products, the ones which are selling huge volumes. And I'd ask them to say, look, I'm really interested in these products, but can we negotiate on the price? Because for us to work, this isn't going to be viable. Here's the price point I need that. Now, this is a back and forth. This is about your relationship. And again, keeping them on board who they are. But what I generally found is that once you start putting in big numbers, you know, if you're happy to drop 2,000, 5,000 pound on that order, then that's going to allow you to negotiate better deals. doesn't always happen. And hey, with wholesale, same as OA, you are not going to be finding deals as often. You are, there's going to be a lot of wholesalers you're searching through and say there is nothing here to be worth buying. Or if there is, the sales velocity is just too low. But for you, is the big thing about wholesale is it's about volume ordering, negotiating discounts. But as well, because of wholesale, you can keep going and going. So it's reordable products you can keep buying forever, you know, for one, two, three years. So the value of each deal is worth more. But for me, what I would look at is I would get myself a lower ROI initially, and then I would look at saying I'd want to make this viable by negotiating a bit of discount. Sometimes they'd be like, look, we'd only do it on your first order, or we wouldn't do it on your first order. And I'd say, okay, let, let's see if make this can work. And then we'd try and put an order through and see how it worked, let's get the sales through, and then we can negotiate a better deal. And hey, even now, a couple of the supplier accounts we've got, we've got things because of the relationship we've built. We've got discounts on all the products we buy. And in addition to that, we have credit terms. So it means the suppliers like us. They think we're really good. We buy quite regularly. And they give us 30, 60 day credit terms, which is like fantastic because I no longer have to worry about cash flowing that as much. And actually, I'm buying big amounts of stock from them, shipping it in, and they give it on credit terms. So that's fantastic and just allows my business to grow better by using other people's money. If you've ever seen Robert Kiyosaki, other people's money. Really good. So, and if you don't know much about wholesale, the big part of it is that the danger of looking at wholesale versus OA is that when you see an OA deal, you're like, great, this is an OA deal, I can buy it now. But you can't buy that much of it. But there are a lot more deals around. But with wholesale, the deals are fewer and far between. But interestingly enough, a lot of the deals last a lot longer. They're actually more viable in the long run. So let's say, for example, if you can buy 10 deals on OA and they sell out after, you know, if the deal was only available for a week, you might only find one deal on wholesale, but you'll be able to keep buying that deal for an entire year. So just a different way to think about it and the value of that deal that's worth it. So wholesale is different to OA and you've got to change your mindset. And OA is kind of like a drug, whereas wholesale is a bit more like slow and steady. Really bad analogy. Um, so that's a bit about my look at wholesale in regards to finding wholesale suppliers and how I'd go about them and again I'd want to get really high to the manufacturer I want to build a relationship with wholesale distribution and distribution and warehouse and wholesale 
Uh, another top tip might be that you actually just go on Google Maps or even the Yellow Pages and load up and see wholesalers. Generally, the harder they are to find, the better because no one else has found them. And interesting enough, they're not worried about advertising because they're trying to keep their prices as low. So top tip, maybe I've done it so many times, Google Maps, wholesale, what's in my area, and I'll physically drive down there. Because these guys don't have websites, but they do exist on a map, and Google Maps has them on there. So that can be quite useful. You can actually go down and buy those products. So finding suppliers, then contacting them, getting the price list, getting the information from them, running your analysis on them is the same as you always do. Look at the long term, but also look at the sales velocity of them. And then think about negotiating price on the sales velocity if you're able to put down enough money. And you can buy wholesale. You know, some wholesalers will be like minimum order, £100, £200. But generally the good ones who are going to give you big discounts or the better prices will be more money. You know, £500 plus, maybe up to a couple of thousand pounds. That's where you need to be. And then finally, we're talking about build that relationship, keep it going, get things like credit terms, get discounts, and they'll come to you with good products or good pricing the moment it comes out. So there are some top tips that I've kind of taken away from wholesale that I think you'd quite like, uh, which would be quite useful. But again, it's about getting in there and just go, go, go. And the big thing I'd say about wholesalers is they will probably say no nine times out of 10, but you have to keep trying and trying and trying. So um, the final thing I'll actually say is try and avoid mentioning Amazon. So I talked about e-commerce, online store, store. So they create a WordPress store or pay someone from Fiverr to do it for you. Create a Shopify store and it might cost you £35. But the interesting thing is, is that's going to add value to your what you're offering. If you come into a wholesaler and just say, or a distributor or even a manufacturer and say, we're Amazon sellers, they're just going to say no because too many people sell on Amazon, there's no value add, they want to keep selling to different markets outside of Amazon. And you might ask the question, but what if they ask if you sell on Amazon? Well, you can certainly say, look, we do sell on Amazon when we want to get rid of products, when we want to shift them, but the bulk of our sales come through e-commerce store. Now, hey, if that's true at that time, and then when you actually start selling, it changes the other way, that's fine, you don't know. But they'll either say, sorry, well, they'll either say, we're happy for you to sell on e-commerce, but you're not allowed to sell on Amazon. Or when you sell on Amazon, you need to make sure these are certain criteria met. But predominantly, wholesalers, distributors don't want purely Amazon sellers. And for you, you just need to be a little bit careful about how you're phrasing that and what you're saying to them to obviously get the account open. But hopefully you found that interesting. And what I'm going to do now, because I appreciate I've got about 10 minutes left, is just jump back onto the comments. So what I've got here is, right, so Sean has come back. To, um, Sean's mentioned I'm in the Facebook group now. Um, I've actually found a wholesaler who's cheaper than Superdrug on certain products. They accept me, but there's a minimum order you have to do per order. Agreed. And hey, interesting enough, if they're cheaper than, thing, cheaper than that, not a problem. In my business, what I would generally do is buy a month's worth of stock. Now, when I was doing wholesale orders, sometimes I'd buy three months' worth of stock just to meet those criteria, to get the discounts, or to negotiate a better discount. And hey, that's just part of doing business. If it's going to work out, you're going to take that risk. You're going to buy more than you normally would, but it will give you a really good profitable item. So hopefully that's been useful. And hey, Sean, well done for you. And interesting enough, a lot of people who make that transition from OA into wholesale, what they'll do is they'll find a really good selling OA product and then they'll go, damn, I can't buy it anymore. Okay, let's have a look at wholesale. Wow, they now start finding a wholesaler who can actually sell that product. And once they get that one product they like, then they look at the wholesaler and say, okay, this wholesaler can sell me one product which works, I already know, what else do you sell? And they start looking through that. And you start finding that each wholesaler you'll have quite a few different products you're buying from them. So Sean, great tip. And uh, Kay, thanks for sharing, great tip. That's really good. Thanks for the feedback on that. And let me just have a quick look at the Facebook group or the YouTube chat. So Reem said, how grocery profit margin works, been looking at them, but the margins are slim. Um, Reem, one quick thing for you, and the problem you're probably going to face is, okay, so general rule of thumb, not, not exact, and you've got to look at HMRC website, is in regards to grocery, now you want to get VAT registered first, is... If the product is ready to eat, i.e. like crisps, biscuits, it has VAT on it at 20%. But if it's not, i.e. it needs to be prepared, and let's give you an example, coffee, tea bags, you've got to make them. They have no VAT on them. So when you're doing your analysis as a non-VAT registered seller, that's going to be difficult. But 
if you are going to be that registered and you're going to be buying things like coffee or certain non ready to eat grocery products immediately then those products will be non vat registered now a lot of grocery items that people go in for especially replenishables will be these zero vat rated items so they are technically vat rich they are vatable items but the amount of that you pay is zero so for you is i'd probably say have a look at that and obviously a lot of stuff around wholesale is going to be based upon buying volume but also as well they're going to be looking at vat sellers because that's who they're normally selling to um, also, just a side note to that, I'd say if you are non-VAT registered and you're not looking to push that VAT threshold, i.e. 85,000 per year, what it currently is, um, my my personal opinion is go for really high ROI products, don't go for, and, and high margin, so good profit, don't go for small profit, small ROI and fast sellers. The reason is, is just getting over that VAT threshold then starts adding more more complexity more work more accounting but if you're a vat registered seller and you're doing the volume already then sure you can go take 20 percent roi all day if it's selling like every week if you buy a product ship it in sold in a week no problem i'll take that 20 percent every week happy days but for the majority of people groceries low roi items below that threshold generally aren't the best things to do because vat registered sellers have a bit of an advantage and also as well because they're already scaled to a point where a lot of automation is in place, they can just deal with lower ROIs and still take the money. So Reem, great question, thank you very much. Uh, Chris, I've got a message retracted so I can't see that one. And Chris West also asked, do Amazon release any quarterly sales figures or any data that relates to quarterly traffic? Unfortunately, Chris, as far as I'm aware, they don't. And you could probably guess why. They, While they know the information, they have no need to show it to anyone else. And they actually try, I think they try and hide a lot of it. So. In regards to like sales figures, what's going on, they have to talk about revenue for obviously they're a public listed company in America. So they talk about Amazon Marketplace revenue and they, they share certain information. But actual sales traffic, et cetera, et cetera, no, they don't. There's two things which I'll probably add to that, which are number one, a recent report I read somewhere, and don't quote me on it, is saying about 50% of all search traffic now for buying, i.e. if someone wants to go online and buy something for e-commerce, they'll go straight to Amazon. They'll skip Google and they'll skip the likes of Argos, Debenhams, etc. They'll go straight to Amazon. So that's really interesting. And then the other one, what was I going to say? Oh, and then the other one was in your Amazon account, and if I can do it, because I haven't actually had any sales, um, here we go in your Amazon account. Let me just go small. So am I going small? Yep. Yeah, so you can see my screen. So under I'm not going to have any sales information here at all. Under here reports, business reports. Uh, I have no data. But what you can do is you can go to um, it might be sales and traffic by child item, and what it will do is it will have the parent ASIN, the child ASIN, and then you'll be able to see like how many page views that product has. So if you are listed live on a product for say a month, you'll be able to see how many views that listing has had in a month. And then obviously how many how much percentage of time you've had buy box percentage and lots of information about it, about the ASINs you're currently live on. So for me it's quite interesting, especially when I'm looking at products like why isn't this selling? I think I've got the buy box. Oh no, I haven't. Or actually, I've got the buy box, but it's only had seven views in a month. You're like, well, no wonder why. Seven people have looked at this product. It's never going to sell. And that's particularly important for things like variations, where you've got one listing and it's got, you know, it might be shoes and different sizes. So size three, four, five, six, and seven. You can come onto this, have a look at the ASIN, and it will show you about how many people have looked at that actual listing and that variation. And obviously, is that going to be a a product that people are going to actually look at and if you're not getting sales and no one's looking at it, now you understand why so hopefully that's been useful for you let me just come back uh, oh no i'm still big okay brilliant so where are we now come back into the youtube so chris thanks for the info not a problem more than happy to help and you know that's the kind of things that i've learned just you know trial and error really and figuring stuff out let's come back onto facebook and say anything else sean says 50 percent go straight to amazon because they have a prime account and want it delivered tomorrow customers want it fast and hey sean i completely agree with you i'm talking to people who are saying you know my my thing is is you know, Sean's now talking about people go to Amazon because they want it delivered straight away and actually you know I live in London and I remember before I went to Vietnam or Thailand 
I was like, man, why am I, why can't I get this today? Like, I was so used to, oh, two hour delivery, click that, buy that, and I would choose that because I could get it in London the same day, which was fantastic. But, you know, in other places in the world, it's like wait five days or something. But agree, Prime Delivery has been a massive benefit for Amazon. And while they've made, I think last year, they made a $3 billion loss on Prime. But obviously, they made massive profits on the rest of the thing. So as a result, Prime is a real kind of go-to draw to get customers to buy from the Amazon ecosystem. And hence why we will sell on it. And interesting enough, if you look at sales volume versus eBay, Amazon is on the majority of products much much higher because they have a much more traffic so hence why we sell on that sean's also just posted in here ebay are discussing fulfillment centers not sure if you heard about this um it'll be it'll be a while yet but they have a company called hubbo uh where you can send stock into ebay and if you just look here i just shared the screen now so interesting of sean um, i had a look at that as well i thought it was quite interested um let's see be really interesting interesting enough on the flip side is to say if you are selling a product in amazon there is there are software there is software actually that can take your listings currently on amazon in amazon's warehouses and list them on ebay for you and then when you make a sale on ebay it will then create a, a shipment order within amazon for what's known as multi-channel multi-channel uh, shipments and then ship it to the customer from ebay and it will automatically fill in the ebay tracking reference number etc etc from the amazon shipment so there is software that does that for you and interesting enough i think i heard somewhere don't quote me on it is that if you call them up while they charge a fixed amount you can actually call them up and they'll charge you per sale so that is an option as well and actually that allows you to sell right now on amazon and ebay if you want to know i don't do that um more for the fact that i haven't got around to it but i'm just it's not so much something i'm interested in doing but if you are you've got a big lot of stock and you want to do it on both certainly you can look at that so have a look at things like amazon to ebay shipping or amazon to ebay listings that's an option so i'm just going to come back to the youtube and check the final thing so look guys if there's any final questions you want me to do appreciate time is coming to an end now lucky enough i'm in the uk so it is only actually five to five normally in vietnam it will now be like the time probably midnight so i'll be quite tired but now i'm okay um, but any final questions drop them in the youtube chat or drop them in the facebook group and obviously i will answer them as well so uh, reem said what are some good categories for replenish rules if staying under the vat threshold my top tip for uh, probably that i would say something like ooh, one second um i'd probably go for something like beauty now <sighs> and i'd actually probably go outside your mainstream stores whereby you're not looking at like debenhams i'd go find some niche brands that you haven't heard of that are selling consistently but you can get some good money on um, and the reason is is when you the cheaper a product is the cheaper a product is the more percentage of that product is eaten up by fees referral fees fba fees if you're selling higher value items the fba fee now becomes a smaller amount yes the referral fee is the same because percentage but your prep cost and your shipping to amazon ups cost becomes a smaller percentage so that means your profit can be a higher percentage so i'd probably look if i was under the back threshold looking for replenishables i'd probably go down something like gro um, groceries beauty um, and i'd probably look for some niche brands and i'd probably look for something which you know doesn't really go outside of like the big stores like debenhams tesco's etc etc because they're going to have big deals so maybe do what i just did on what do you call it wholesale whereby you go into you know kind of it might be like skincare for example scroll down hit sales rank thirty thousand, and then just keep going after that looking for brands where there's no amazon on and then go and try and find if you can see them on oa or wholesale that might be a good option so that's my top tips or what i would do looking at replenishable for under the vat threshold and i probably wouldn't do wholesale because they're going to be that registered but you might be able to find a deal so great question Reem and thank you very much for that one so I'm just going to go back now to YouTube, uh, Facebook and if there's any questions let me know so Kay has asked about what software is that Kay off the top of my head I don't know um, I will find out but I know it exists so I will put a post out and I will drop it in but I know it exists that you can list you can take your current listings and it will create them automatically on eBay and fulfill them for you 
and then you just pay pay for the shipping which is a bit more than fba um but actually it could be an option especially with something like sean is where he's looking as well instead of doing it the other way um but hey so okay i will shout that you want to know and then interesting sean's just put a comment in there i'm going over the vat threshold going all in and seeing what 2020 does for my business hopefully it still takes after that it, it takes after even being VAT registered uh, I'm going to have to accept my profit margin won't be the brilliant, but list more and more items except Lara ROI products now too now. Sean, yeah, the VAT is obviously a tax, value added tax, and when you go over eighty five thousand per year, or you know, going to come up to that, you have to register with VAT, and that's currently in twenty nineteen. Obviously, if you're not sure, speak to an accountant. This isn't tax advice. Um, but I, you know, for you is to say you're growing and hey, you're really putting the effort in, definitely. But one thing I should just say is look at some of your processes and see what you can systematize, outsource. There are going to be parts of your business that you just don't need to be doing day to day. And then you can focus on the other parts. And as you grow, that's going to really help you. So, Sean, well done. And hey, great to see that you're going over the VAT threshold. Yes, it's a pain. We'd all like to stay under so we get more profit. But on the flip side, it means your business is growing. And obviously, if you're making the profit, good man really really good so finished up on facebook and thank you everyone for all the comments and hey look thank you everyone for spending your sunday evening four o'clock with me that's really good and hey if you if you're watching this on the replay thank you so much and hey for all those of you watching on youtube and on facebook really really grateful i really like doing these i like sharing i like giving back um, it's just nice to help people in the amazon business answer the questions because hey when i'm out in vietnam a lot of the time no one really understands Amazon, so it's great to do this as well. But look, if you've got any other questions or anything else you want me to go through, um, I will put another, I'll put up here, if you're watching on the YouTube replay, a link to the next live. So if you're interested in asking questions, you'll be able to click here and join the next live and at the end. And then finally, if you like this kind of content, be sure to give me a big thumbs up. And maybe you've got some questions or comments or you just found it useful, drop me a comment down below that'd be really great or something you want me to talk about next time and then finally if you're watching this on the YouTube you know, and you like this kind of content give me a uh, subscribe and that'd be like down here and also you'll be able to subscribe and see all my videos and I've got another one tomorrow coming out about Q1 which will be really helpful and hopefully it'll be really useful for anyone worrying about the difference between Q4 and Q1 but for me Thomas Parkinson at Fast Track FBA thank you very much